On today's episode, we'll be talking about technology and technology addiction. We live in an age of unparalleled technological advancement. Technology is constantly opening up new possibilities that seemed impossible in the recent past. What is all of this new technology revealing about the state of our hearts and how is it affecting our brains? What precautions do we need to take to ensure we're engaging technology appropriately? And how can we glorify God with our use of technology? These questions and more on this episode of Engaging Culture. Well, well, hello, hello and, and welcome, welcome to, to episode, episode 10 of, of the Engaging, Engaging Culture Podcast. Podcast. I am Brian Kiley, joined this morning by my co-host, the one and only Pastor Lance Hahn. Hello, hello everyone. everyone. Good to hear from you, Brian. Brian. Good to hear from me. Everyone, everyone else is hearing from you. from you. Oh, well, it's, it's good, good to hear me. me. It's, it's good, good to talk to, to anyway. Yes. yes. And, and we're also joined by our special guest, our good friend, Pastor Matt Bach. Matt, good morning. Good day. Glad, Glad to, to have you with us. How, how, how are you today? I'm doing good. I'm excited to talk with you guys and hear your thoughts. You know, I kind of feel like you are an expert in this area because of how much work you've done with youth for so many years, and this is their world. All right, sorry, just pointing that this out. Is, this is true. I have uh, uh, baptized, baptized by, by fire, fire in the <laughs> technological, technological yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, milieu. milieu. Yep, yep, if we can we say, say it. Milieu it, sounds it, good it, on a microphone. It, I does, it, was it, mil- does, you. it does sound good. I'm not sure about That's the correct mildew. pronunciation. But so, so that actually leads into, we're just going to get right into it, our first question. We're talking technology, technology addiction, all sorts of stuff related to that. Matt, you obviously have a lot of experience with in student ministry. For those that don't know, you were the high school pastor here for how long? Seven years, seven just about. Just years. Shy of seven years. Seven, seven years. You've now moved into an adult ministry role here at Bridgeway. You're teaching a class at William Jessup called Trends in Youth Culture. You're also a adult who is an, an adult who is raising uh, three children of his own. So in the last few years, in all these different realms where you're interacting with technology, how have you seen changes in the way that technology affects people? Yeah, it's such an important question, which is why we bring it up in the class, which is why we talk about it with teens, which is why we're talking about it with parents, right? Which is why we notice it all around us with adults, right? It's not a teen thing. It's an everybody thing, especially in a country like the U.S. where we, we're kind of so advanced in technology, right? And, uh, and so you see technology start um, becoming this ever-present backdrop, right, mm-hmm. to everything. And, and we're not talking about just... Uh, just things that are like battery powered or powered, you know, like electricity powered, but we're talking about anything that um, ends up becoming another piece of something we have in our homes, we have in our lives, we have in our hands. And so, uh, so, I mean, we're starting to see technology become so present that it it starts affecting how everyone's functioning. Right. And so like a couple of different things that you see, and I think a lot of us joke about it all the time, but you know, just the, you know, you start always with the picture of people with a phone or a tablet or some kind of screen in their hands everywhere, Mm -hmm. anywhere they go. Um, You know, it's built into the back of car seats, you know, in our cars now it's, um, you know, it's on refrigerators, you know, so that way, and and it's streaming from one room that you can go into the other room and it's, you're tracking with it. Right. And that you have that type of stuff, but then also just the access that we have all all around and how that keeps getting built into every company, every business, the on-demand culture, right? That if we want food, right, there's now um, DoorDash, right? That any place will deliver what you want. And and that's because of the ease of, you know, and speed and efficiency that technology brings in, right? Um, Things like verbal intelligence is the thing I'm, I'm starting to joke around with a lot more, that we have Siri and we have Alexa, Right. And now it's like even when there's something that we can't get done, Mm -hmm. it's like I'll just talk to this artificial intelligence, (laughs) you know, and do this. And I was just talking to Lance about, you know, like these are things that, you know, in the 90s when we were watching Star Trek Next Generation, you would like laugh at some of that technology. But now it's like, you know, it's a computer, Earl Grey, hot. Like we're not far from that, that you can tell your, your house what what dimming and what level of light color you want. And you can tell it to change the temperature and you can, you can uh, ask it questions and it will give you even personal reflections. And, and even the reason why you know that's important and that's dominating is because you're seeing shows like Portlandia and Saturday Night Live and, uh, and other shows do a lot of satire on this technological presence and technological overload yeah. and, and, and how that the addictions, that they're a soft addiction, right? 
um, not always, but uh, how it's it's this ever present backdrop that um, keeps going on. And so I think everyone agrees that it behaviorally is shaping and reprogramming people. We just haven't processed enough, right? Right. On what level it's doing that, and is it and is that healthy for our souls, right? And that's why it's become such an important conversation because it's really. Do we just turn it off? Because that's not really a solution, right? right? We can't all just become Amish and cocoon from culture and this technology because it's not the technology, right? Right. So, so we have to talk about it. We have to process it with one another and start trying to engage one another in community more, especially as Christians, on what's healthy and what's what's beneficial and what's safe, right? Yeah. So, and and there is so much mystery around this because, like you said, we don't know fully how a lot of this technology is affecting us because it's so new mm-hmm. and Last because 10 years. the pace of change is so rapid. What it's interesting when I when I find myself wanting to read about something related to technology, social media, things like that, I'm constantly looking when was this when was this written? I mean, if it was written before 2016, maybe 2015 depending on the subject, it's obsolete as far as I'm concerned, right? Yeah. And and that's, you know, true amongst a lot of different types of technology. So, Lance, what about you? How have you seen technology uh, affect people in the in the last couple of years, whether just in your personal life or, or with your family or in other places? You know, uh, there was a there was a quote that I remember reading through uh, an article, and I think you may be relating to it a little bit later, but that was Andrew Sullivan in the New York Magazine um, or, or – nymag.com but he talked about living in the web yeah. and and there's this powerful phrase that he said he said it's an either or either you're online or you're in the physical world it's not an and and i think that we're trying to pretend that it's an and yep. um and just talking about me personally I have a super addictive personality, so whatever you refer to about it, like anything can become addictive to me. Right. Um, but uh, one of the things that I was giving up, we, we have uh, done things in preparation where we do different fasts, and I'm doing a 40-day kind of cleansing fast of different things uh, towards minimizing distraction and holiness. Well, one of the things was actually media interaction, that I've been trying to reduce it. Uh-huh. And... Simply put, it's not, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but for me it is. I really am wrestling with, while I watch TV with my wife, I'm on my phone doing something completely different. Yep. And that's the only way, the the TV show is not captivating enough to me. Now, you have to understand what type of shows we watch. Mm -hmm. We are watching shows like The Brave, right? Mm -hmm. Which is literally people going through and rescuing people, and it's all energy, all action. So it's not like we're watching. We're not watching, like, slow building things. (laughs) We're watching the maximum level of interactive explosion, and it's not enough. Mm -hmm. I am on my phone doing not just one game multiple <laughs> games on my phone. And yeah. so one of my things was, man, I really got to mellow out with that. I really need to shift back and go a little bit more into reading and stuff like that on these 40 days. Uh, I am currently in, I believe, day seven, uh, day six or day seven in this. I have failed twice. <laughs> Two out of the seven days were an ultimate fail, and one of them was yesterday. It is so hard for me to break out of this, and I see it everywhere around me. Yeah. It's, I mean, that, that's true because we are so immersed in it. It can be very difficult to, to break free from kind of the, the allure of screens and technology and all of that stuff. And it is, it, it's to your point, Lance, about watching TV and then having something else in front of you. Even the multiple screen uh-huh. idea, you just think how crazy that would have been 10 or 15 years ago. Whereas now, I mean, I do the same thing. I was working on the outline for this podcast with Monday Night Football on in the background and my phone next to me. Yeah. It, multiple, you know, there wasn't another person in the room at least, but I've been chastised by my wife many times for, hey, we're watching this thing together and we end up having to rewind it because you're looking at your phone, like checking your stupid fantasy football scores or something. There's, all, you know, this need to always have something else going on. What does that say about us? Well, I and, I th- and I think what's hard to add another piece into it is that within our, our culture, like we we come in with this aspect of we deserve this, right? Yeah. There was a guy in the late 80s, early 90s named Robert Bella that wrote this book called Habits of the Heart. 
And he kind of assesses this within our, our Western worldview that we come in and we look at it as our freedom and our right where we go, man, I deserve to decompress. And so when I come home from work or I come from something, I, I, I have the right, right, to decompress. And so I think what happened is that was getting established just in the, the heyday of TV yeah. being developed more in the 80s and 90s, right? And then as we blew into the 2000s and – YouTube and web and Hulu and Netflix and um, you know social media now suddenly that became even more that it's it's like I do it myself I come in and my wife and I will say like hey like we're gonna watch something because we just want to right even if we really should be going to bed or I've just worked for two hours in the evening till 10 30 and I really should be done with anything and do something more relaxing I'll put it on as a backdrop right because I want to, I need it, yeah. is what I, I justify. So it's funny because we, we, we really quickly just place ourselves into that spot right. and, and then become very dependent on it. Like I echo with Lance, like I'm, I become so dependent on digital media. Um, you know, I tried to do that. Um, I think the first time we did a fast, I did a digital media fast. And I mean, again, I was working with youth culture and that's really bad. Like that's risky because you cut yourself out from everybody when you're doing something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, can I just add one little yeah, layer please, to that? Um, here, here's the other piece that I think is a little scary, is uh, you were talking about how your wife gets mad at you for being <laughs> distracted. My wife gets mad at me for a different reason while we're doing that, because she's like, we're not together, right? Yeah, she does the but, same thing with But here's too, yeah. the weird thing. This is why my wife doesn't criticize me on the other piece, is because while I'm doing multiple games, while the show is on, I'm tracking on the show better than she is. <laughs> this is what's super weird. This is what's super creepy. We watch And you these... say that to her? That's oh, the... yeah, absolutely. <laughs> She's like, annoyed you're playing Candy yes. Crush while you're okay. explaining the show to so her? So here's the funny <laughs> thing. I'm that good. <laughs> well, here's the funny thing about it. We watch, once again, I'm watching Madam Secretary, and they're talking about different governments and all these things spinning around, and it's looping all these characters in, and she goes, wait, what's happening? And I will recount the exact same thing because my mind is spinning that fast. So I think that what's unnerving is we can do all these things yeah. at the same time. Yeah, yeah. That's you, can a, be, you can be partially distracted and it. and still and still do that. And I, I think by. you know one of the things I, I end up talking about in our class is you know one of the great things is is this is an era of great com complex creativity and so much access we have more access to the beauty of the creativity that people are creating in writing shows in posting up beautiful pictures in yeah. sharing things in literature right we have more access to all that but now it's this era of testing as well where we're actually having to see whether this innovation is fulfilling us like right. that's really the question is this fulfilling us or is it actually draining us? Right. And I think that leads into some of the yeah. other things we're talking about. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a great point. To take to take a look from a more positive perspective for a moment. I think yeah. it's it's such a funny thing. Technology is funny because I think we're all gonna sit here and we're gonna talk a lot today about some of the challenges of it. And like we all know that it's bad for us on some level, but we all still engage with it, and we're all going to leave from here and engage with it. We've got multiple screens even in here in the studio with us, you know? So so there's all of that kind of going on. But I want to talk positively about technology for, for a moment and just ask, ask you guys, and I'll share my thoughts as well. What do you personally see as some of the benefits of technological advancement specifically and specifically what are some technological advancements of the last couple of years that you personally really enjoy the most Matt, I'll, how about I'll, you kick I'll, it off i'll start with one and we can kind of just go around but uh i know that like i have a good friend that um, him and his wife have been missionaries in sudan for almost 15 years and uh in the beginning um, all they had was a satellite phone. Remember when they used to talk about those in movies and stuff like that? And the only way I could get a hold of them is through a website where I could send a SMS text to that phone and kind of communicate with them. So it was very yeah. intermittent, right? Um, now, you know, he's still in the same country, same kind of, you know, like like not as much access. Um, but because of the technology, I can get on an app like WhatsApp and text him and be in exact time yeah right with him or do phone calls you know over skype it used to be skype but now it's almost every platform you can do a video video chat right yeah. um to somebody across the world i mean that to me opened up incredible access and then within the christian world to missionaries right that yeah. you could be in you know same time with them 
Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, How about you? I, I, obviously, when you were talking about that, it made me think of when we uh, live streamed our baptism. And families across the United States got a chance to see their family members baptized in real time. I was like, yeah, that's cool. cool. The thing that was, uh, before you started sharing, that I have been always impressed by is the ability to share information, to stand on the shoulders of the people that went before. So, for example, in the medical community, now it's not a matter of I only have the knowledge of what patients have come into my office. I now have access to all your research. I have access to what is happening in all the hospitals. And so now we're advancing and advancing and advancing in such a rapid rate that we don't have to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. When you see this certain rash, boom, you throw it up on your screen and you're like, that's the one. What a beautiful use of technology. Couldn't agree more. I think the opportunity for, for innovation is is stunning. And, and, and medicine is certainly a great example of the level of collaboration and innovation that's possible due to technological advancements is, is really pretty pretty mind-boggling. I mean, I I personally, I I don't consider myself super tech savvy in the sense that I don't have all the latest gear and equipment and I don't read blog posts about it and all that. But technology is a big part of my life like it is for both of you and for for a lot of people. And personally, and this speaks to some of my issues definitely, but I'm not the most patient person in the world and not in the sense of like, I'm going to snap at somebody impatient, but like, I just really don't like to wait and just kind of be idle. I'm not good at that, which I probably need to get better at it, but I just love the convenience that comes with technology. I normally drink my coffee at home, but if I decide I want to get a Starbucks, I can place the order as I get in my car in my driveway mm -hmm. and just walk past the huge line of people and just pick it up off the bar when I leave. You know, if I, I mean, you know, we live in, I live in Lincoln, California, where you don't really use Uber much, but if I ever travel, travel, I love the simplicity of Uber. I love the simplicity of being able to get recommendations on things easily, Yelp, things like that. Uh, and then obviously the connectivity to speak to your point about uh, your missionary friends. I love that whether it's friends in another city, uh, all over, you know, people all over the world, or if I'm just working late and want to say goodnight to my kids, that I can FaceTime with them and do that. It's yeah. extraordinary, and I think yeah. it's really, really exciting. Yeah, the utility piece is the piece that I think all of us would agree that the utility utility of technology has been so amazing things like small things we take for granted like the technology that goes into designing shoes for greater comfort right yeah. or that goes into you know they put those sensors in our car tires now you know for checking your tire pressure and yeah. that not only helps your fuel economy right but safety right and then now you know the technology that's come out and i don't have it in any of my vehicles yet but where it can like parallel park yeah. right or it can give you a sensor if you're crossing a line right and that these are all you know, lots of technology is first either for convenience or safety or or advancement, right? Medical technology we could go off on, and there's people probably that listen to this that can tell us a thousand more. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things we do in our class is we just spent half an hour having everybody just list out all the technology they can think of um, that's out there right now, just the first things that come to our mind as a class, right? Um, yeah. But what's interesting, and I'm not trying to derail your purpose, oh, go ahead. is that despite all that utility so much more money and time and resources go into the amusement and entertainment side of technology oh sure and that's and that's i think why there's it's always this man there's some blessings and some amazing pieces but there's these confusing pieces as well yeah per that was perfect <laughs> to hear yeah, a, yeah. a little ding text, and there's the text uh, message uh, <laughs> you know right in there yeah and i mean certainly there's an extent to which uh over entertainment, I mean, um, the kind of amusing ourselves to death sort of concept or yeah. sort of inoculating ourselves to caring about what's <laughs> what's real because we're so focused on kind of amusement. And that sort of leads into my next question is uh, I think I feel like everybody's got or everybody can relate to this sentiment, even if we don't have a story like right off the top of our uh, top of our heads. But have either of you ever thought or that your relationship with technology might be unhealthy or have you had something happen in your life that is sort of a canary in a coal mine kind of thing where you just think, oh boy, I need to, I need to get a handle on this. Anything come to mind for either of you guys? Oh, absolutely. One jumps immediately to mind. And uh, it's, it's that when my, I was, once again, I was, the TV was on, my, my phone was on and my daughters came in and it was much more tempting to say, I'll let my wife handle it. 
yeah. when I had other things going on in front of me as opposed to stopping those and engaging with my daughter who actually had a situation. And once again, I went through to justify it. Well, they're going to talk to mom about the, the lady things and everything else, and so maybe I don't need to be. And then when they walked out, when my daughter walked out, my wife looked over and she goes, you can't put it down just when our daughter walks in. <laughs> and, and even though I had all the justifications in the world about why there's no point in me looking at her because she wasn't looking at me anyway, uh, bottom line is it was wrong. And I'm consistently struggling with that. So, yeah, I do yeah. think there's some challenges. Yeah. Yeah, and there's been know. a lot of studies on that type of stuff that there's more young children that, that they actually think that some young children might avert from this addictive – tendency because of what they watch in their parents right and i yeah. and i and that's convicted me so much that you know when my four-year-old is trying to get my attention and i say just one second and then you know i feel that inner turmoil but then i watch thousands of parents as i go out into public that are doing the same thing they're they're disregarding because this is i, I this is just the priority at the moment i need to get this done right yeah. and i don't know what they're doing on their phone it could be a very like life like purposeful text that they have to get out, but sometimes it can't be. Uh, but those things, like uh, I, I, I see how much it it distracts me from sometimes what I need to be doing, yeah. and how much it interrupts what I need to be focusing on, whether that's family or that's ministry or that's even trying to hear the spirit mm -hmm. speak, right? Like taking it into our spiritual lives and our formation. Um, that distraction to me, it becomes so. Um, so so off putting, yeah. right? And uh, and and yet I I jump into that water so fast, right? And I'm I'm not talking about just like digital online media, but I'm I'm talking about having to keep myself distracted. That yeah. you know I I then chase after that distraction. It it, it really concerns me because I I have an addictive personality as well. That you know you put this in front of me and it's gonna keep drawing me in. And and you know what's funny is like when it comes to devices, like we had an iPad when I used to live down in Southern California, that was like the first, you know, computer mm -hmm, other yeah. than like what a, like a, a laptop or a, or a, a desktop. Do you guys remember what a desktop is? What are, the, <laughs> so, what are, what are those? Never and, heard of uh, that. And so, but it wasn't until actually I, I came to Bridgeway that I got a smartphone, right? And, and just seeing the personality habits that I used to critique when I lived down South and people that had them, now to, that you have the drug, yeah, that that I that I was doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're nicer to addicts, yeah, so. Right. so I blame Bridgeway <laughs> for that. Amen. Because uh, they uh, they uh, you know allowed me to get one of those, and uh, they could have stopped me. That's and, right. Uh, That's right. Because it wasn't my choice. Of course, no, obviously, <laughs> obviously not your choice. You know, no. it's interesting. I something that was very eye opening for me was uh, on vacation this summer. I read a book by a guy named Carl, uh, excuse me, Cal Newport. And the book is called Deep Work, Rules for Focused Success in a Distracted World. And it was incredibly convicting on a number of levels. I tried really hard to apply what I learned from the book, and it worked great for about two weeks. But <laughs> here was the big issue, is that he talked about kind of non-essential engagement with technology. Those aren't, aren't his words necessarily, but things like social media, things like, you know, 30 cat videos that are going to make you go OMG, you know, th things like that, sort of these diversionary type things. And he talked about how in our brains what happens is if we come up against any sort of resistance on, say, a difficult project, it's almost like the pressure is building and our brain is just looking for an escape hatch. And the escape hatch is... 12 things on social media that you really don't care about, but they're giving you something to focus on other than what you're actually doing. And I realized how, how susceptible I am to exactly that thing that, oh, I'm working, I'm working, oh, this is getting hard, eh, ESPN. You know, oh, I'm working, I'm working. Oh. And, and the level of access we have to all of those things is, is challenging, but, I mean, the bigger issue, of course, is learning this skill of pushing through and not sort of taking advantage of the technology that's ne that's next to us all the time. So that was very eye opening for me, just to realize, gosh, this this problem he is diagnosing. I am, I am number one, like right there. Like I absolutely am am susceptible to that. Well, and and spiritually, it removes the opportunity for solitude, right? Like I think we don't take. I think we forget that that like even if we want to go into a time of solitude with the Lord, we 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 still will have this on us and it can distract us it's very rare for us to go i'm going to go have a place where i'm going to escape 
yeah. and go have time with the Lord, then I'm going to leave this behind, yeah. right? And again, we think that utilitarian wise, right? We go, well, if my family needs to get a hold of me. There's an emergency, or I need to get a hold of someone. But like to to we forget that that argument was is only like <laughs> 30, 40 years old, right? It's, like it's that. that people yeah. constantly could go and escape people to have times with the Lord. Like, you know, when you look at even Jesus going up on mountains to pray and he always was moving somewhere with his physically, smartphone. right? Well, he had like, he knew, <laughs> he knew about it, right? Because because the Lord is timeless, right? He knew about, never mind. And he still didn't so, have a smartphone with him. But, Impressive. but, you know, he, he always would go somewhere. He would move up a mountain. He would go into, and I think sometimes when people are, are recognizing or thinking about solitude, sometimes we have to move away from the technology in order to get into the solitude. And then at other times, it, the technology can be leveraged to give you access, whether to it's a reflection or a poem or a song lyric, right, that you can play in the background. So that's what's hard is I'm like, I can say the one side, and then I at the same moment I go, well, but at the same time I could, the, today when I was driving in, I was listening to Bible Gateway, um, the right. audio Bible while right. I was driving in, right? So I was using the benefit of this to be able to get my cup filled yeah. as I was going and trying. So this is that double-edged sword that you sure. brought up. There's, you know? there's unbelievable benefits. We have, ac I mean, I'm an information junkie. There's access to information, things like the Bible online, things like podcasts, like this one, uh, audio books, <laughs> all of that. There's so much out there. So, so I think it's a mistake to say, oh, technology's bad, and here we are you know, talking about the evils of technology. That's not really the point. But I do think... There's a challenge here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference a, a quote from Andrew Sullivan here in just a second. But, but before I even get to that, Lance, I want to ask you, what do you think – what is the access to technology revealing about our hearts that we need to be paying attention mm -hmm. to? Good question. Uh, so I, I think it blends exactly with what you were just talking about. I, I think that what it reveals is our desire to numb out and to get away. Um, I think it reveals um, – so who was the gentleman that wrote the article about It Almost Killed Me? Andrew Sullivan. Andrew Sullivan. Okay, so you're going to go into that. Yep. He said a quote when he was talking about going into, he was trying to break away and go back into some quietness. Yep. And he said, he said the leader said, remember, if you're suffering, you're thinking. Hmm. And his whole point was, we're avoiding suffering. We're avoiding anything that's difficult. We are running and running and running, and our hearts that we're using this stuff to try to get away. You said anytime it gets tense, I'm working on something, I get frustrated. Boom. You want to numb out. It is the number one reason why I use technology is to numb out. My heart does not want to engage with anything that hurts. Yeah. My heart does not want to engage with anything that's confusing or makes me feel bad or anything else. And so I don't want the quiet. Uh, the quiet hurts. Yeah. The quiet's painful. And yeah. so I really think that for, for my heart, it reveals the fact that I'm not okay with how things are, and I need them to be different. And it's almost like, I don't want to project on you, because I think I can relate to what you're sharing, but it's almost like things are hard, and I just don't want to deal with them. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. How about yeah. you, Matt? What do you think? Well, I mean, uh, one of the things this led me to kind of process is we did a um, an ethnography experiment in our class, and it was and it was kind of one of those assignments that I think all college students would wish that they got because it was, hey, go binge watch a show for four hours, and write down your observations before, during, after, how much you engaged with another device during it, how much you engaged with the show, you know, yada yada. Yeah. And we were we were chatting through it after everybody had done it, and with some really good input from all of our class. But I think the biggest piece that we saw that um, was really interesting, and I was sharing this with Brian um, earlier this week, um, was this reality that, you know, when people did it, they felt emotionally and mentally not not like. Oh, yeah, like I'm thriving in this. That yeah. this, is, this feels good. Right now, some of that had to do with they all were high responsibility students, right? <laughs> and they were like, I could be doing more work or be more efficient, the expectations. But uh, but a lot of them just almost felt like, ah, oh, this is such a waste, really. And yet this is what so many more people, especially with our Netflix generation, you know, get into. So, I mean, we're, we're having a little bit more emphasis on media, I think, within this. But uh, but one of the, the the observations that came out in our discussion was, that feeling that they all had from watching continual shows. So video streaming, right? Uh -huh. Versus if you were to sit and listen to music for four to eight hours, 
and how it doesn't give you that same emotional or mental feeling. Or if you were to sit and read a book mm-hmm. for four to eight hours, again, the the emotions, the feelings, the thoughts aren't aren't as negative. And yeah. so, so that was just a, a really keen observation from our class of, well, there's something about the video streaming or the thing that's drawing us towards a device versus just audibly or with our with our eyes and our imagination, yeah. right? That it's it's starting to to um, tear this down. And so, um, but yeah, like it, it, uh, it was such a, to me, powerful yeah. thing, but I think the biggest piece is that powerful things shouldn't be, should always, should always be approached with caution, right? right. That's, that's what yeah. you kind of realize with this. This has more power than we realize. Mm-hmm. And so I need to treat it with a lot more seriousness as if it's plutonium, right? <laughs> that I'm not going to deal with lightly. I'm going to deal with seriously every time I engage it, but I need to engage it you know, to use it both in ministry and life, but I just want to come in with more caution. Yeah, we have to be careful about it. Do, I mean, do you have any sense, either just you personally or anything that you've read, any explanation for that? Like, why is it that video watching leads to that, or television, leads to that kind of yuck, whereas music or books don't? I, I haven't, I don't have as much um, research on that. Mm-hmm. I would like to do a lot more. I yeah. think coming off of that study in our class, sociologically psychologically but it's you know again you're going into then years of research as they're tracking with people um and i think there's been a lot written on it within christian and non-christian circles so i mean it wouldn't be hard yeah i'm sure there's stuff to ask rabbi google the rabbi google uh, speaking of technology so that's right um one interesting point i i want to make as we and then I'll, i'll transition back to to andrew sullivan here is you talk about asking Google. I remember when I got my first 3G phone, a Motorola Droid, you know, a long time ago now, and I remember standing in line at the DMV, and I remember getting out my phone to just look at who knows, whatever, who cares. And I had this, this kind of revelation in that moment where I re- realized, oh, my gosh, I don't ever have to be bored ever again <laughs> if I'm by myself. <laughs> right? and, and also with that... It led to, uh, th- I think, the existence of 3G, the existence of all this technology. Now, of course, 4G. And are we into 5G? I don't know. Whatever. Lots of Gs. <laughs> and, I'm waiting for a G6. Uh, it, it, in a sense, has created what I call the death of wonder. Hmm. And here's what I mean by that. It's the death of I wonder. I wonder who won the Academy Award for Best Picture in 1976. You can find that out in four seconds, Right. I wonder what the population of Denmark is. You know, like you don't have to wonder about facts anymore. Everything is already there. And I actually think that's cool. That's interesting. We, you know, we don't have to sit and argue about things. We can, you know, Siri, what is the, you know, she can tell us the answer. Yeah. Uh, but then, of course, we have to be careful. Does it lead to a different death of wonder where we're so absorbed in our screens where we fail to take in a, into account the, the world around us? But um, I want to read a quote here. From, from Andrew Sullivan because it speaks to this issue of is technology really the problem or is it a hard issue? And it's a little bit lengthy, but I think it's worthwhile, and I want to get your guys' thoughts on this. Is He says this. He says, since the invention of the printing press, every new revelation in information technology has prompted apocalyptic fears from the panic that easy access to the vernacular English Bible would destroy Christian orthodoxy all the way to the revulsion in the 1950s at the barbaric young medium of television, cultural critics have moaned and wailed at every turn. Each shift represented a further fracturing of attention, continuing up to the previously unimaginable kaleidoscope of cable TV in the late 20th century and the now infinite, infinitely multiplying spaces of the web. And yet society has always managed to adapt and adjust without obvious damage and with some more than obvious progress. So perhaps it's too easy to view this new era of mass distraction as something newly dystopian. A lot of good words in there. Yeah, he can tell he's a good writer. You can tell he's this is why he does this for a living. But he says that, okay, people have been freaking out about music or excuse me, about media for a long time. I said music because I was thinking about you, you know, you hear back in the 50s how, you know, Elvis Presley comes on the scene and all of a sudden that's like just the worst thing that's ever happened and everyone's just going to hell in a handbasket because of it, right? So we all tend to freak out about these new advances, but what do you make of what he's trying to say here, Lance? Is he is he right? Are we 
missing something by calling it, quote, newly dystopian? Is he missing something by saying there hasn't been any damage? Uh, make some sense of this, this for us. I don't think that I don't think that he's saying that there isn't any damage. I think that what he's saying is it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Um, I think that um, in terms of our ability to uh, compensate or acclimate, right, to, for us to adjust into whatever happens, uh, the the sad reality is that um, uh, some of you are old enough to remember Chernobyl. If you remember the Chernobyl issue where yeah. there was a nuclear. Uh, leak, right? I mean, yeah, where fallout, yeah. fallout, yeah. right? So bad things happen, and it was over in the Eastern Bloc. People learned how to live in that environment. Okay, so you can live in unhealthy environments. It wasn't the end of your world, but it really distorted your reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think what he may be accurate about is it's not an apocalypse. Mm -hmm. What he may be inaccurate is that it's actually more unhealthy than he even really realizes. Yeah. That would be my guess. So there's some so there's some unhealth unhealth being prompted and we just don't even really realize it. Is that essentially what Yes, you're I think it's I think it's more intensely difficult than he might imagine, but it's not the apocalypse that everyone's running for the doors for. Right. Yeah, Matt, and, what do you think? Well, in the rest of his article, what's good is he reflects some of that personal unhealth because he goes to a retreat center and is trying to detach himself from this overload and this addiction himself. So so he recognizes it, but I think he's trying to do the same thing we're talking about. He's trying to discover what's the balance, right? Like how, because this can be like over responded to where people want to go Amish or go, you know, go back to, to the original. But he's also saying like, you know, this is doing something, but people are adapting within it. And, and it's a good question for Christians because we're trying to figure that out with within our engagement with culture, yeah. right? At what point do we recognize where God transforms or rises above culture and uses it to send his truth and his mm -hmm. message, right? Which is always, a, for some people, that's a slippery slope. And for others, they see it as huge leverage, right? And we can go through all sorts of passages um, with Paul and Acts 17 and others, you know, um, with even Jesus, you know, in, in terms of how he, he taught about stuff. But but, you know, like, that's the thing that he's trying to figure out. But I, I know that initially I, I, I felt like I disagreed with his statement about how, you know, society has always managed to adapt and adjust without obvious damage and with some more than obvious progress because I've, I've went. But how do you define that, right? Because the damage yeah. spiritually and emotionally that I feel like we see now which can be just as bad as we can say 100 years ago, but it's different on an emotional, mental, spiritual level, especially within our culture that we're right in the midst of, right? Wouldn't you yeah. guys agree? I mean, that's a big statement to say. Oh, but, sure. But, I mean, all the stuff that we talk about mentally, emotionally, spiritually, um, and we're not blaming it on media and technology, but it becomes another factor right. that speaks into it. And I, I think the damage just hasn't been – I think we're afraid to talk about it because then it means – backing up from it right yeah, and anything that sounds like backing it. up sounds bad yeah. right it's uh so i'll have yeah. another thing to say in a second about J.R.R. tolkien on this but okay wanna... yeah it's like uh, hey this is a problem but let's not talk about it too specifically that i have to actually actually Make change. change well and i think <laughs> it's interesting you know lance you, you referenced earlier this idea of technology sort of saves you from engaging with difficult things and i can certainly relate to that i would imagine matt and a lot of our listeners can as well I think, you know, you talk about technology having a positive or negative effect. Um, there's a book by Andy Crouch called The TechWise Family. I just started listening to it uh, this week. And he talks about this idea of is technology nudging you towards or away from the life that you actually want? Yeah. And, and I love the idea, for example, of, say, create a, you know, we have missional communities here at Bridgeway. My missional community has a Facebook group that enables us to communicate with one another very efficiently. I like that. That is leveraging community, right? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, techno technology in a lot of other ways can uh, distract us from community, not, not even distract us, can sort of drive us away from community because it's an easy way to kind of get the dopamine hit of community we need without the hard work of actually sitting with somebody, being in their presence, making plans listening to them uh in a way that it's not easy to just if you're talking to me face to face i can't just after two paragraphs of you talking just sort of look away at something else i mean that's yeah you know so that's a good example so, so i think that where we have to be careful is just looking at technology and saying is it encouraging 
the life we actually want, a life of community, a life of friendship, a life of richness, a life of deep engagement with God and with the world, because technology used properly can facilitate those things. Or is it causing us to withdraw, and is it pulling us away from the hard work of everything from engaging with people in relationship to planning planning a good vacation, all of these things, <laughs> that it's just way easier to just get sucked into a get sucked into a screen. So I think we need to be be mindful of that. Yeah. Uh, talk to us about J.R.R. Tolkien. Well, yeah, it's uh, I was talking to Lance about this earlier because uh, I, I'm a big Tolkien fan. Um, and and one of the things I value is what they were looking at within literature and within life. But uh, but when people really dug deep with Tolkien about why he wrote Lord of the Rings and what the ring was supposed to represent and people interpreted that ring, the one ring to rule them all yeah. as so many different things. Right. But in the end, when you read some of his comments and explanations to his editor as well as to others, it ended up being technology was what the ring ended up for him representing is that he was looking at what it was doing in his world in the 1930s, 40s, yeah. right? Which obviously we're looking at World War II era and, um, and, and kind of the dawn of a lot of in industry, you know, coming out in technology. But, but, you know, he was looking at it as this thing that although it's meant to do good, it was it was ending up destroying the world hmm. and uh and so you know that was why within the book he was writing all these different pieces in about um you know the elves and the hobbits and all <laughs> these people that were supposed to be like almost purists right that he he was looking at they wanted to look at the beauty of what can be created without always having to run towards the most advanced and industrialized pieces, you know, or the simplicity of, of life without it. But then you even see characters in the book, Gandalf and Gal Galadriel, Galadriel um, end up saying the ring gets offered to them and they say, although I would desire to do good with it, mm -hmm. I would end up using it to lord over people. And the only reason I bring that up is because I think his evaluation of that that I value is that he, he just is again saying this is something more powerful than we realize. And that that when people get their hands on it, it, they start with a good intent, but it can be the heart, right? Sin within us can twist that so quickly, and then it becomes to the detriment. And and I guess again, like, and I'm not trying to just lean there towards the negative. My worry always is with me, with my kids, with the people I work around um, in this area and the church, friends and family, is that I feel like everybody. And this is maybe overstating it. Everybody is so pulled into that. It's being leveraged. Technology and this addiction is being leveraged so much more by amusement and entertainment. And I feel like it's destroying more. Mm -hmm. So, And yet I'm trying to figure out how do I keep using it to God's glory and letting him right. transform it. Yeah, so, without getting but I said that right. longer than I wanted to. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Yeah. I mean, Lance, what do you, what do you think of all that? Well, I think that with every advance, there's a cost, right? And and we were talking about everything comes back to hearts. I think technology is a temptation, yeah. right? Uh, you can use it one way or another, right? Um, in one sense, how awesome is it that a young girl now can FaceTime a grandma who's on the East Coast from the West Coast, and you go, that's beautiful. That actually is drawing together. That is something – because really, I mean, back when the Titanic was around, we were writing letters to each other it's no different it's just a faster letter yeah. and you go you go so oh letters are good they are good but they're also come at a cost what was the cost of the letter unhealthy communication because once again it goes back to texting what we gain from the waste of being with someone physically is you can't escape out of the conversation yeah that forces a growth in a certain way whereas if i text you I can edit what I'm saying, I can edit what you're saying, and I can drop you at any moment. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, advance good temptation to also lean into the dysfunction of it, right? Yep. We didn't yeah. talk about autocorrect being one of the best technological <laughs> advancements. <laughs> that did not come up until you just said that the, right the, now. The, 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 There you go. Auto, <laughs> autocorrect, uh, the, 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 the savior for some and the bane of existence for others. So uh, turning a little bit, and Matt, you've kind of pointed us to a couple of different scripture passages, but I, I just want to look, look briefely at, at one of my favorite verses in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 5. Um, Paul writes in Ephesians 5, he says, uh, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Uh, how might a verse like that, thinking more specifically about the wisdom component here than the 
today's evil, although that's certainly relevant. How might a verse like that guide us as we try to engage with technology appropriately? Oh, you're pointing at me. I'm pointing at you. Uh, you know, like, like to me, that that verse becomes such a big discussion piece. Um, I, I don't, I kind of don't know where to start. <laughs> so, <laughs> because, uh, because to me, like, like part of it is really challenging us to consider how we, how are we using our time, right? Yeah. And again, like to me, you've heard me mention the term entertainment and amusement a lot, and distraction and all that. You know if that's buying up all of our time, which is what marketing wants, mm -hmm. right? They want us to be engaged with everything all the time, yeah. right? Um, I show a commercial to you guys to, to watch that's from Xfinity with Mark Wahlberg going around kind of reestablishing, you know, this marketing piece for them of, you know, we want everything all the time everywhere. Yeah. And, and what's happening is that is buying up people's time. Mm -hmm. And, and so when you hear a passage like this that's saying, you know, look carefully um, to, in how you use the time, it, it's, it's really giving us a caution to go, you know, I want to walk in the places that I'm going to actually be filled and thrived, which means I need to walk with the Lord and allow that to buy up my time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, again, though, it's, it's, a, it's trying to choose who's going to be it's trying to be wise and who's going to be Lord over how this is used. And yeah. so it's in a sense, you're kind of going, how can I surrender? technology into the Lord's hands to go, God, you show me, you direct me and how this can be used for my growth, my health, for the benefit of community and for others. And, and Lord, please don't allow, um, you know, the flesh or the world system to be the one to leverage how this is using my time. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. That's one way I think about it. Absolutely. No, that's I, that sense of of surrender and placing it under the lordship of Christ as opposed to allowing technology to, to lord over us, which, uh, as you stated, there are many different parties in the world with a vested interest in us allowing technology to, to lord over us. I mean, that's that's powerful, and I think that takes some discipline. And, I, and it, I think it's the sort of thing where nobody says consciously, you know, I want technology to rule my life. Yeah. Nobody says that consciously. We just don't make the conscious effort to prevent that from happening. So it just kind of happens. Which, yeah. which well is said. a challenge. Well so, said. what about you, Lance? What I mean, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise. Uh, give us some practical pointers and this well, sort of thing. Well, let me let me as normal. I'm going to take it a little bit of a different take please, to please it, do. right? Um, in that passage, here's my concern. Uh, a lot of people read that and they what they see is you guys be more efficient. And I, I you know, because we were talking about amusement and all this stuff. Well, that's bad and everything. I I take a completely different take at it. I don't think over efficiency is wise um i think we do need waste i think we do need amusement because one of the reasons i'm so addicted to my phone is i have a world that allows me to be so efficient that i am cramming so much into three hours of work that normally would have taken people three days when i do that there's a burnout that happens and there has to be a recharge. So when we see that and it's like, hey, you got to be wise, got to be, you know, you got to do it better, got to make sure, make the most of every opportunity. We already have a country that's obsessed with the busier you are, the higher your status. We already have a society that says maximize everything. Uh, don't wait, don't lose one second at DMV line. You can do something on your phone. Right. The office never closes. Go, 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 go. And in my mind, that is actually not wise. I think that's killing us and causing us to need to numb out. Yeah. And I think it's feeding on itself. Yep. So, yeah, so I for me, I, I see the beauty in waste. Uh, like, for example, um, and I've done so much work on this, but for example, do you remember how growing up your musical taste got developed? Um, almost always it was I heard a song and I went, wow, that's really good. And you added it to your repertoire. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you're going directly to a song when you already know about it. And so, for example, when they used to play albums that you didn't want to go over and skip songs, it was too much work. So you'd let the whole album play out. Mm -hmm. What happened was it forced you to listen to not the best track to listen to the, listen to the rest of the tracks. Mm. In that waste, whereas now you can pick and choose off iTunes and you grab the one good song, you listen to nothing else. Yeah. In that waste, like the browsing through a store, when you order online and it's the exact same thing that you want, you pull it, you didn't see that tweed jacket that you went, dang, now that I'm looking at it again, <laughs> that's kind of cool. 
Yeah. There's no browsing in that sense. And so the waste, it's so efficient, we miss an awful lot of beauty yeah. because everything's tailored. That's a great point. And it's interesting, in, in the course of this whole conversation, we've really focused on, for lack of a better term, kind of the, the tendencies towards sloth that comes with technology, mm. right? The, the opportunity to, to numb out and to, to spend lots of time, you know, binge watching, things of that nature. But Lance, what you've brought up is equally important, and that is that technology does cause the office to never close, right? That that technology can maximizes lead us, efficiency. Exactly. Right? That yeah. technology can lead us towards extraordinary workaholism and terrible work-life balance. And I, I would imagine all three of us are guilty of probably not being present with, say, our families at some time in the last week because we were looking at something work-related when really we probably shouldn't have in that moment. So I think that's an incredibly important point to realize that if we're going to have wisdom, as God desires us to have wisdom, that has to be holistic. That, that over-efficiency, like you said, that's not wisdom. Efficiency within the bounds of when it's time to work, that's wisdom. Presence with family, that's wisdom. Appropriate downtime. We all have recreation, and I think the last thing we'd want to say is, don't ever watch Netflix, it's bad. You know, Just, just don't watch nine hours a day, right? Uh, we need to have that appropriate mm-hmm. balance to not fall into sloth on the one hand, laziness, just constant shallow living, or the go, go, go hyperactivity all the time, right? Yeah. No, I think that's beautiful. And what some people want is they want to know what's the way of having that discernment, right? Because I think everyone's going, you know, but how? And that's where, and we don't have time to go through it, but another passage for people worth looking at is 1 Corinthians 6, which is verses 12 to 20, and 1 Corinthians 10, where Paul tries to go into the same type of principles back in his cultural day of, you know, everything is permissible, mm-hmm. but not everything is beneficial. And he tries to help people understand in certain contexts, but that it it transcends into things like this, mm-hmm. how they can try to make some of those um, make some of those discerning decisions on trying to choose wh- how do I determine what's wise? You yeah. know, when do I determine when it's beneficial and when it's constructive for others or not lording itself over me? Right? Because right. the six and ten talk about those differently. So if you get the time today, um, yeah. Google that. <laughs> And right, uh, use sure. technology. <laughs> Google, watch a YouTube yeah. on it. There you go. Um, and, uh, <laughs> let me. I'm going to bring in a kind of a weird reference. Ju- yeah. Just um, on uh, just the other day, uh, someone came up and they asked me a question about Genesis 11:6. Genesis 11 uh, that includes the Tower of Babel. Yeah, is really the story. And in there, God said, "Man, the way that I've designed the beauty of man, there's nothing they can't accomplish. I got to shut this thing down." And he confuses the language, and they spread out. What is so ironic about that is he's saying, listen, I've made them so brilliant, they can hurt themselves. And so we're right back into the same conversation, right, which is the Garden of Eden. You know what would be awesome is get more wisdom. Do you remember that? When she saw it was desirable for gaining wisdom, she grabbed the fruit, right? And the serpent's point was more is better. Don't you want to know this? Don't you want to have access to this? And God was going, actually, you don't. (laughs) Not all advancement is healthy. And you knowing that, you're now more miserable than ever. That's never what I wanted for you. Uh, and, Tol- Tolkien and, would hug yeah. you right now. Well, and, and in, his, in his tweed jacket. In and his tweed jacket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that he got from Goodwill browsing. Well, yeah. well done. And and what was I mean, obviously there was spiritual things going on uh, in the Tower of Babel story, but what was the Tower of Babel essentially? But an inappropriate use of technology, bricks, uh, the ability to build. That's what it was. It was, it was, uh, it was technology sort of becoming their god in a sense. Which yeah. it seems crazy to think of bricks as technology, but a day will come when it seems crazy to think of iPhones as technology. So, absolutely. So it, it makes me want to. Bl- I'm sorry. It's, no, you're good. Lance spurred something in my mind. Um, although we're almost out of time, but it is a great question for maybe another discussion. Which is, um, is aspects of our are aspects of our technology going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. This this becomes quite a discussion. Do we go back to a biblical Garden of Eden where we're all frolicking around naked? <laughs> or are elements of culture and the beauty and creation of what God you know built into mankind that they have created, are those pieces that are going to be 
integrated and people interpret that different ways but uh i assume it, we'll all just be staring at screens for all eternity so just kidding that was a joke and not a yeah. very not a very funny <laughs> way so so as we begin, kind of, I, I, I do think that's funny. a great i think that's a great question uh yeah th- who knows we could speculate all day i suppose but yeah. uh as we're beginning to kind of land the plane here here here's my last my last question i'd like us to to talk about uh, is is this okay? How for for our listeners? Let's just try to get really practical here for a minute. How can I begin to recognize maybe problems in my interaction with technology, and then what are some practical steps I can take to be a little bit healthier in that regard? Matt, why don't you go ahead and go first? Um, yeah, probably the I'll probably just say the piece on you know some counsel, which is um, because so much, especially media and amusement, entertainment that we engage with, happens in private. Um, very few people outside of our family or sometimes our roommates know about the content or the quantity of what's going on. And so I think our first step is to not allow these things to remain secretive, right? Yeah. This is that whole thing of, especially when you're part of a church, engage with each other in community and open up that transparency so that you involve more of God's people in your accountability of it, right? Man, so, that's so, so huge. Do, do, people, do other people know what I'm watching and how much I'm on? Have I even ever invited anybody to ask me about my usage? and what yeah. I'm doing and with my time, right? Because, you know, God has always wanted us to grow together, not just as an individual. And so, you know, this is kind of tearing down that individualism and going, no, like I want you guys to now ask me questions because we've been doing this podcast about how my time and usage is going, you know, you know, to be involved in that and not just, well, that's Matt's world. That's his private, what he does with his time. No, like we're, we work together. We're in ministry together we're on the battle lines. Yeah, I guess uh, mine would be um, if you are sensing increased anxiety or depression, uh, it may well be technologically related. And Mm. what I mean by that is the anxiety is you're getting information overload or things are coming in that are scary, like your news feeds and stuff like that are either tripping you out or this constant over demand of efficiency is kind of spinning your your little hamster wheel too fast and you're (laughs) starting to break apart. But even on the depression – our, we live in a world where you're so connected, you compare yourselves to the best of everything, yep. and you compare yourself to everybody else's best. And what that does is it takes those that wrestle with depression, and it, it puts a temptation to go dark really fast. And my recommendation is wise, selective unplugging. Mm-hmm. Th- there's yeah. really, sometimes you actually have to, to get away. You can't simply like minimize it. You actually have to unplug it. You just got to turn yeah. it off. Our youth at Hume Lake, when they go and there's no Wi-Fi and there's no um, no cell service up at Hume Lake and students, we take their phones. It's funny to watch that initial piece, <laughs> but to watch how good they feel when they're up at camp because of that selective w- distancing withdrawal, you know, so that's ama- yeah, it's, amazing. Yeah, certainly, certainly selective withdrawal at appropriate times is is important. I, th- I think. When it comes to technology, I, I try to be mindful of the extent to which it's mediating my communication with other people. And here's what I mean specifically. I'm not talking about email and text and things like that. I'm talking about how, how much am I using technology to sort of consume non-directed communication that is forming my opinions. Here's what I, here's what I mean. Uh, social media, for example. Am I understanding people based on social media posts? Am I understanding people based on things I happen to read online? Or am I taking the time to talk to people? Yeah. Am I taking the time to understand them? Am I taking the time to really listen? I think that one of the challenges of technologically mediated communication is that it reduces our sense of empathy. Mm -hmm. It reduces our sense of a desire to understand one another. And, and that, I mean, so many things contribute to to polarization and the division in in our day and age, but I really do truly believe that's one of them. So I think it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to simply ask the question, am I taking the time to listen to people? Am I taking the time to engage with people who are different than me? And am I not settling for kind of the dopamine rush that comes from consuming something new, 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 new? And am I wading into the richness and the challenge and the work of real relationships, real community, not just looking at a picture of a tree, but going out and looking at a tree and and, hug the tree. and hugging the tree. And am I allowing technology to fuel something real as opposed to let it, letting it be a substitute? And to the extent to which we're allowing it to be a substitute, making practical changes, getting outside, putting away your devices for a little bit, just trying to be comfortable. Even I did this... Dennis, Dennis appointment for my kids the other day, left my phone in the car and just sat there 
and just trying to be okay just within myself for 20 minutes, half an hour, and not having to do it. You anything. are a brave man. It was, it was terrifying, but, uh, but we managed to do it. So anyway, I mean, technology, obviously, it's beautiful. It's brilliant. It's amazing. So many opportunities. Uh, we just need to be wise and discerning and just pay attention to what it's revealing about our hearts, right? Amen. Yeah, Amen. any uh, last word, Lance, give uh, it yeah, to us. Yeah, final thought. Um, for either corporations or organizations or us individually, I think looking at a holistic, bigger picture of saying, um, what is happening to us? What road are we going down? What is the cost of us having an attention span of 30 seconds? What if God has things that we are supposed to soak in or receive over a longer period of time, and you will never have those? What blessings are we missing, and how do we organize our lives so that we get the blessings of both the beauty of technology and the beauty of something that we had before? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, that's really good. Really, really good. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Engaging Culture. If this episode spurred something in you, if it caused you to think, find a friend, invite them out for coffee, put away your cell phone, and even turn off this podcast and uh, chat with them a little bit. Uh, you will be uh, better for it. You'll be glad that you did. Be sure to join us again in two weeks for the next episode of Engaging Culture. Thank you for listening to Engaging Culture, a podcast by Bridgeway Christian Church. If you enjoyed the show, please consider subscribing and leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you so much for listening. Music is used under the Creative Commons license and is provided by Dexter Britton.